Let's be standing for our first song, please. Mm -hmm. There is an endless song that goes in my soul. I think most of you know that that's my favorite song. And the reason it's my favorite song is the author, Ed Cash, uh, was one of my son's Little League baseball coaches. And we used to talk together, and uh, he was such a kind, gentle man. And the way that he preached the gospel was the way he lived his life, and clearly by the way that he writes music. His wife used to sit in the stands and she would cheer for her children and all the other kids that were on the baseball team. And the way she would cheer for them, would say, she would say this, let your light shine, let your light shine. If you're here this morning visiting with us, thank you for coming our way. And you clearly have let your light shine by showing up this morning. And hopefully we're letting our light shine by showing you how much we want you to be here and how excited we are that you're here visiting with us. Folks, I would like you to know I'm super excited this morning because I look over here and I see Nick and Trish Boone back with us this morning. How exciting is that? <laughs> oh, Nick Todd himself rocked around the clock and made it right here. Most of you don't know that he had a uh, career in uh, music and uh, was, what year was that, Trish? Trish, Trish said, I wasn't even born then, so I don't know. <laughs> 58, 59, was on the charts with Rock Around the Clock, Nick Todd. Wow, what a great, great to see you guys this morning. Aren't you glad we have a church family? Aren't you glad that we can come together and worship the Lord no matter what the circumstances may be? God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Let's keep it worshiping. Good morning. Our scripture this morning will come from Revelation 11, verses 15 through 17. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Will you pray with me? Father God in heaven, we, we thank you so much for your greatness and all the blessings you pour out upon us. We pray that you will 
work your will on this earth. We pray that you will let us be your hands and feet on this earth, carrying out the things that you would have us carry out. We pray that you will work through our interactions with others, through our institutions. Have your will be done through us on this earth. Please, Lord, uh, bring your provision upon us. You know our needs. You know our wants. We, we confess them to you, and we bring them to you because you can provide more than we could ever imagine. Father God, we just ask that you um, just let your grace abound upon us. Uh, we're all, we all fall short of your glory, but your grace is ever, ever abounding and covers us all. And we pray that you will just let us give that same forgiveness to, to all our other fellow uh, passengers in this world. Father God, um, we just ask that you, you lead us away from, from anything that might trip us, from anything that would cause us to make other people trip or stumble. We pray that you will just, um, just keep those away from us and lead us to your glory and stand by us. We pray that you will just find this worship service we bring to you this morning, a fragrant offering, and we pray that it will be pleasing to you. Thank you so much, and it's in your, your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand for our unison reading that we will all read together and for the songs to follow, if you don't mind. From Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, read with me please. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's sing together. <clears throat> There is a habitation near by the living God for all every nation who seek that friend the Lord. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see O Lord. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? 
Until March, this was the time when we would uh, come together for our contribution. We would pass baskets and they would go up and down the aisles. We would drop our uh, cash or our uh, checks in there. Well, under the pandemic that we have going on, we've uh, changed that. Most of us have adjusted. And uh, some of you wonder, well, what is it uh, that is still going on? Well, the church has evolved an awful lot. We haven't changed the works that are going on. Uh, we have uh, had videos the past two weeks and for this week and two more about the, our missionaries uh, that we have uh, either down the road, like at Inner City, which will be our video next week, or like the Melaritos who are over in uh, Greece. Uh, many of you have met Alex and a lady. Uh, they'll be talking about their work, which has had to change uh, quite a bit uh, with the pandemic that is going on. And they'll be talking about that after our um, uh, prayer here in just a moment. Uh, our mission committee, uh, you wonder, well, what are they doing? Well, let me tell you, they get together at least once a month by Zoom. We, we do the social distance thing, uh, but uh, they get together. They're very active. Uh, and those on our mission committee are John and Jill Parker, Colin, Kate Beck, Dan and Cynthia Bickle, Bill and Elizabeth Marquette, and Julio and Beth Rivas. And we want to uh, say thank you for them because they uh, put in a lot of uh, time and effort in the many things they do. If you would, would you uh, bow with me now as we thank uh, God. Father, uh, we come together uh, at this time thanking you for uh, the many wonderful blessings uh, that you've given us, Father. Uh, we realize that day in and day out, uh, we are a very blessed people. Uh, Father, we're most grateful for the fact that you sent the Christ down to live uh, uh, among us, to show us how to live, to show us how to love, and most of all, Father, to save us. Father, we're thankful uh, for our family uh, that we have here at uh, the Green Hills Church. We're thankful for our surrounding families uh, that uh, we see day in and day out, sometimes that uh, we're separated from. from. We're thankful, Father, uh, for uh, our families, uh, for our friends, for our loved ones, for the jobs uh, that we have. We realize that uh, many throughout our nation and throughout the world have been affected uh, by their jobs uh, throughout this pandemic. Father, we pray uh, that you continue to watch over us and guide us. Father, help us uh, to uh, know and to rely on the fact that you are in control, uh, that we uh, lean on you every single day uh, for our strength and for our guidance. We thank you for everything that you've given us, for the way that you have taken care of us, and for the way that you will take care of us going forward. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, church at Green Hills. We hope you're doing great in God's love and blessings. We greet you with the love of the Lord. And we wish to thank you for all these years that you have blessed our family and the o Omonia Church in so great ways. We are indebted to you and to our God. We have been blessed to have six more souls added during our recent uh, retreat in Corinth, six souls, plus two more who were immersed into Christ about 20 days ago, and two more who were immersed last Sunday. God is blessing us with new and interested. Through this pandemic, through this difficulty, we have grown stronger and stronger. We have learned how to work things with Zoom, with Facebook, live streaming, non live. We can say nothing else but give thanks and thanks and ever thanks for your great love the support that you have provided through through these years to our family regarding the retreat in Corinth which is a great uh, evangelistic asset and all that you've done through letters, emails, notes of encouragement we love you dearly God be with us
This morning's scripture reading comes from Revelation 12, verses 7 through 11. <clears throat> now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved and loved not their lives even unto death. It's now time for the kids to go to the sunshine worship. And if you're visiting here and have a child ages two through the second grade, we would encourage them to participate. During the singing of this song, if you'll just take them to this double door, they'll be taken to the outdoor class. So let's stand together. Come and see the sunshine, come and see the sunshine. The sun is shining brightly, it's happening right here. Come and see the sunshine, come and see the sunshine. But we have a special treat this morning. I was reviewing the material Scott sent me, and I left out a song that he wanted us to sing. Unfortunately, I don't know it. So Denny is going to read it to us following this song. So let's stand for this song, and then we'll be seated for Denny's reading of the next song. It
I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fall, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. If you have a Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 12. We'll be there this morning. I wanted to tell you that today is a holiday for many who are in Christendom around the world. Uh, yesterday is Halloween. It was all actually called Hallowed Eve. And in the beginning, it was a time when uh, believers in Christ would dress up as the saints that had gone before them, those who had been martyred, those who had lived uh, the Christ life, and they would go out at night on the night before this important day. But on this day, All Saints Day, the church would think about those who have died in the Lord and especially the martyrs of the church. And it's uh, interesting that the passage that we'll be closing with today from Revelation chapter 14 speaks of those who die in the Lord from now on. Notice what it says. It says, then I heard a voice from heaven who said, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, the spirit cried, for they will receive rest from their labor and their good deeds will follow after them. And so all over the world today, there are people who are lighting lights, candles, and remembering those who have gone before them, who have lived the Christ life, who have uh, become a picture uh, for them of what it means to be a saint who dies in the Lord. And so I wanted us to pause and just think for a moment about those that we've lost this year, and then also about those that uh, have really inspired us to live the Christ life. And we'll pray and then we'll continue with the message of the morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have died in the Lord, who have received rest, whose good deeds follow after them in our lives. We pray for comfort upon the families. We pray that their lives might inspire us to live more rightly and more godly. We thank you for those souls who have died a martyr's death, for those who have ventured into foreign fields and paid the ultimate price to honor you. And Lord, we pray that we might be inspired uh, to uh, live rightly and to live with boldness and purpose uh, the path that you've laid out for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wanted to uh, remind us that John the old man is sitting in a cave on the island of Patmos, and what God is giving him is a vision for the church. It's happening at a time when the Roman Empire is at its worst. It's happening at a time when the Caesar is so against Christianity and all that it stands for that they are mortal enemies at this time. And what John is going to do for us today is he's going to invite us to reimagine the Christmas story and to understand what takes place in the Christmas story as a cosmic story. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation chapter 12, or you can read along with me up here, and you'll notice uh, that this cosmic Christmas story puts a different spin or a different way of looking at the story that means so much to us every December. It says, a great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant. She cried out in pain. She was about to give birth. But then another sign appeared. 
an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment that it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to the throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her where she might uh, be taken care of for 1,260 days, just a period of time. And what we notice in this passage is this woman who is our Mary figure represents, will discover an image for the church. The dragon will discover is an image of Satan. And of course, the son is an image of Jesus who is born, who reigns, and then who ascends into the heavens. And what we discover is that a war broke out in heaven. Michael, the chief angel, and all of his angels fought against the dragon and his angels who fought back. And the picture that we have is that the child has ascended back into the heaven and the dragon and all of his forces are chasing after it. And Michael and his angels come out and there is a mighty battle in the heavens and what it tells us is that the dragon is hurled down to the earth because he's not strong enough. This one who leads the world astray, the devil, Satan, he's hurled down to the earth along with all of his angels. And when he's hurled down, you hear this song that comes from the heavens. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, he's been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and to the sea. Because the devil has gone down to you, he is filled with fury, his time is short. And so we discover that when the dragon knows that he's been hurled down and that he can't snatch away the sun, he goes after the woman. And the woman goes into hiding and as she's going to hide, the dragon chases after her and he spews water at her in order to drown her, but the earth drinks up the water and spares her. And she goes into hiding and it tells us that the dragon is now enraged. He's enraged at the woman and her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Chapter 12, Cosmic Christmas Story. When Christ is born into the world, the battle between good and evil begins to rage. And what we see happening is that there's a war that's happening between good and evil, and that those who follow after the Son are those who are living a life that the devil is out to destroy. And then we come to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, the dragon now conjures up another beast. And this beast has 10 horns and seven heads and 10 crowns upon uh, those horns. And this beast has a blasphemous name and what he represents is the Roman Empire and all of the Caesars who have been part of the Roman Empire. And the dragon has given this beast power and a throne and great authority. And we read that one of the heads of the beast, we think this is Nero, has a fatal wound. And people begin to worship the dragon and the beast. And they ask, who is like this beast who can wage war against it? What happened at this time is that Rome is the most powerful force on the planet. They are the world order, the world empire. And what's happened over time as various Caesars have been replaced by other Caesars is that they began to deify the emperor. No longer was he just a ruler, but he was a semi-god. And then after a period of time, he moved from being a semi-god to being fully God. 
And by the time that John is writing here, they weren't even waiting for an emperor to die to call him fully God. They were calling emperors who were still alive to be God as well. And so there was an emperor cult and those who were going to be in the good graces of Rome worshiped the emperor. When they said Caesar is Lord, they were saying Caesar is God. And they would talk about various emperors as the son of God. And so what we notice here is that what is happening inside of Rome is that it's not just a world empire. It's not just an evil world empire, but it's an evil world empire that's claiming to be deity. And what we find here is that the whole world is chasing after the beast and people are worshiping the dragon and the beast and asking who can wage war against it? Who could possibly be stronger? And a power to wage war comes from them and everyone who is not following after Christ is racing after the beast. Those whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. And so we think it couldn't get any worse, but then John says, oh, one more figure for you. There's a lamb with two horns, but if you listen, he sounds like a dragon. He's the antichrist. He's the one that gives power to the beast. He's the one that gives authority to the beast so that it can function as a deity and it can begin to wage war against those who are followers of the Lamb. And what you notice here that's so important for us in our culture today is to notice that it forced all the people, great or small, rich or poor, free or slave, to put the mark of the beast upon their forehead. And if you didn't have the mark, if you didn't show that you were worshiping the emperor, it was going to cost you financially. You wouldn't be able to buy or sell unless you had that mark. And if we could live in the day that John is writing this, we would know that there were so many believers all through the Mediterranean who had lost their businesses, who had been shunned by the rest of society because they didn't have the mark on their business that said, we worship the emperor. And because of that, there was great distress. And so this calls for wisdom. This calls for us to understand what the beast is all about. And that's where we hear this number 666 that Denny's gonna explain to you after church today. Actually, I, I think it's a reference to Nero, but I think that you can just appreciate that it's the antichrist. It's that which is fully opposed to the lamb. And so we come to chapter 14 and you're gonna be so glad that we've come to chapter 14 because we've got a dragon, we've got a beast, we've got an antichrist. And it just seems like everything that's happening is showing a society in chaos, but that has an evil power working underneath it to thwart the purposes of God. But then we come to chapter 14 and we look and there's the lamb standing on Mount Zion over all of the world from that place. And all of those, the 144,000 that represent every believer who is following after Jesus, they're gathered there. They have the name of God written upon their forehead and they hear a loud sound from heaven like rushing waters but it's the sounds of the harpists playing their harps. And then they heard a new song. And this song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, no one could learn the song except for those who were followers of the lamb and had been redeemed from the earth. So evil is trying to show its power. It's trying to show its fangs. It's trying to show its authority over the earth and the lamb shows up and all those who follow him gather around and they began to sing. And after they finished singing, what we discover, I hope, yeah, 
is that these are the ones who follow the Lamb everywhere He goes. These are the ones who have decided my life mission is to please the Lamb, to follow the Lamb. These are the ones who have been purchased by Him whose lives are blameless. And then three angels show up. And I was so glad to see the angels. And I hope you will too, me too. Then I saw another, the angels flying in midair. And they had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every tribe and nation and language and people. And the first angel said this. He said, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. The first angel says, judgment has come. Worship God. Give him the glory that he deserves. The second angel comes behind and cries out, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. That's code for Rome, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of its adulteries. Rome's going to be judged. And the last thing, the third angel appears and says, and all of those who have followed the beast and have drank will now receive God's fury. It will be poured out upon them. And so the angels close by saying to people like us, these are times that call for patient endurance on the part of God's people. These are the days where you keep on keeping on. These are the days where you remain faithful to what you pledged and what you promised. And you keep doing the things that please the Lamb. You keep living a life that pleases the Lamb. You keep following the Lamb no matter what's happening around you. You are committed to the Lamb. And you know that there's a song that you get to sing with the Lamb because you've been faithful. And then it reminds us there's a blessing that comes dying in the Lord. Because when you die in the Lord, you receive rest. And every good thing that you've done, everything that has been part of the fabric of your life follows after you. And it makes a difference in the lives of those who come next. Many of you know I'm from Texas, and in Texas we have rattlesnakes. We have lots of rattlesnakes. As a matter of fact, I went to college in West Texas, and like there are rattlesnakes everywhere in West Texas. So many so that Sweetwater, a town down the road from Abilene where I went to college, has what they call a Sweetwater rattlesnake roundup, where people go around and they gather up rattlesnakes and they take them in and they extract the venom from them and they make the antidote and then they cook the, uh, the, the rattlesnakes and they taste like chicken. But catching them alive is really hard. And one of my friends got bit by a rattlesnake and ended up in the hospital for two weeks. And we decided after that it was a lot easier to gather a rattlesnake if you cut off its head first. And so when you cut off a rattlesnake's head, that's not the end of the story. Some of you may not know this, but when you cut the head off of a rattlesnake, it still slithers and it still bites and it can still poison you even though it's dying and it's going to lose. And what the revelation is telling us is that the dragon has lost. Its head's been cut off. It's still on the earth and it's still looking to use its poison to do as much damage as it can before its end comes. But what we know 
is that it's lost. And that the lamb has won and that the victory is ours in him. So to summarize this morning, there's a battle that's going on in heaven between good and evil. And it's happening and playing out upon our earth. Satan has been hurled down to earth in defeat. His time is short and he is angry. And so political and societal systems are easily corrupted for Satan's purposes. Christians must be on guard for those who appear to be following the lamb, but speak like the dragon. It could cost a follower of the lamb financially and societally not to bow to the culture. This life calls for wisdom and endurance. You've got to read God's word. And even now, we join with Jesus and other believers to sing the songs of victory. In the midst of the working of the dragon and the beast and the antichrist, we follow the lamb into certain victory. This is gonna be a challenging week. We know that Tuesday is gonna be a day that is going to really bring out some of the best of who we are as a society and has the potential to bring out some of the worst of who we are as a society. And as we're living through this season, it could be easy for us to be in despair. And it's right for us to remember that the lamb is over all. And every political system, every leader, everything that takes place is under his authority and under his rule. This song by Longfellow was written during the Civil War. As he's looking at what's happening in the United States during that time, it was Christmas and his children and he were on different sides of the war. And he wrote, I heard the bells on Christmas day, their old familiar carols play. Wild and sweet, the words repeat, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But then he thought about what was happening all around him in his culture. And with despair, he said, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And that may be how you feel right now. There is no peace on earth, it feels like. And so this is what Revelation has told us this morning. But the bells were pealed more loud and deep God isn't dead, he doesn't sleep. The wrong shall fail and the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill toward men. These are the days to follow after the lamb. They call for patient endurance. They call for great strength. And they call for us to understand that we live in victory. And we look forward to the final victory that comes in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not following him, it's time. If you need hope this morning, there's good news. The lamb is victorious and he's yours. If we can help you in any way, that's why we're here. I hope this encourages you this morning and into the week ahead to live a life that proclaims the goodness of God in the land of the living. And if we can bless you in any way, come to the front as we stand and sing this song.
as we prepare to share in the Lord's Supper together, and Grant leads us in those thoughts, let's sing the song in vain and high and holy lays. Scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. I'll be reading from the ESV, the New King James is on your screen. Then I looked up, then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was, was the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Let's pray for the bread. Dear God, we come to you now, thankful for this time where we can commune and remember your son's sacrifice. Remember his uh, body that was shed on the cross so that we can be blameless, Lord. We're so thankful for that, and we're so thankful for him. In his name we pray, amen. Let's pray for the cup. Again, Lord, we come to you now, thankful for this time of communion, Lord, when we can remember your son and his sacrifice. And we're thankful for the blood that was shed that washes, washes us clean, Lord. And we're so thankful. As soon as your son's name, we pray. Amen. We are so grateful that everyone was here this morning. Hope you have a wonderful week. There are lots of opportunities in the week for worship, some, time, some in place together and others uh, virtually on Zoom or through telephone. So please be looking for those and emails that you will receive. Let's stand together as we close and you will be um, released from the back toward the front. Jeff will go to the back and release you by rows. And please, if you want to congregate, do it on the lower level and just to the right so that people can get back to the parking lot easily. Thank you so much for being here.
are dismissed. God is the source. Hello friends and family, I'm Ronnie Ferris, an elder at the Church of Christ in Green Hills. We are honored that you chose to begin your week in worship with us. James 1, 16 and 17 say, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I don't want to rush by this too quickly. Specifically, verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from God. That reminds me that I am not the source of gifts I possess. God is that source. This is a totally different mindset from what we're hearing in today's world. But when I understand that God is the giver, then I realize that all the credit goes to Him and not to me. I'm reminded of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 who gloried in his own pseudo accomplishments and didn't give God the credit and glory he deserved. Because of his neglect, Nebuchadnezzar was turned into a beast of the field for a period of time. With this in mind, let's remember that the gifts God has given each of us are just that, gifts, which are on loan to us for a short period of time. We didn't earn the gifts and we don't deserve them. They are all God-given and should be used for His glory. Think about them this way. We didn't earn them, we don't certainly deserve them, and remember that they could be taken away from us at any time. So while we have them, we should manage them well. Let's not claim that these gifts come from us because we're not the source. If people come to us and say, we're amazing, we need to realize that we're not amazing, the gifts are amazing. The gifts actually complement God. That's what we want. We want God to be glorified through the gifts with which He's blessed us. So when people compliment us, we need to pass those along to God and say thank you. So let's keep, keep things in perspective and remind ourselves that others are applauding God through us. We just happen to activate the gifts that God has given. And with the proper perspective, we will know that God is the source. Let's give Him the glory. This week our challenge is to remember that the good gifts come from our source, God. If you'd like to contact us, you may at elders at cocgh.org. We'll be glad to hear from you. Until next time, have a wonderful week.